Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the NUS Initiative to Improve Health in Asia, or the NIHA Forum. My name is Priyanka Anand, and I will be your MC for the day. We are very pleased to have with us here today the NIHA International Advisory Board, government health representatives from various Asian countries, representatives of Singapore government agencies, and academics from NUS and other leading universities across the world. The aim of this forum is to promote discussion on key health challenges and to identify common issues in health policy within an Asian context. Discussions at this forum will help shape the key health challenges that are to be studied and the core research that will be undertaken. We will begin the day with a plenary session titled Healthcare Policy Challenges in Asia. This session will be chaired by Professor Sitaram and will have three presentations. Each presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. I would now like to introduce Professor Sitaram, who is on secondment from the ADB and the director of the NUS Global Asia Institute and the director of the Institute of Pol Water Policy at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, to please give the welcome address and chair the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Priyanka. I hope you all had a good lunch. Uh, normally, the first session after the lunch is quite a challenge uh, to keep everyone awake. So uh, let me try and make some introductory remarks to explain to you what are the expectations of the day and a half uh, forum. We, we've had an excellent start with the minister uh, kicking the session with the dialogue and very frank conversations. I got feedback informally uh, from several colleagues at the lunchtime that all of us enjoyed it. and. I think now we have uh, the setting the stage that has been done. Uh, that brings us to the real work. Uh, in a sense, uh, we brought as many of you here today. This is the inaugural forum of a 10-year program. Our idea is to learn from you and keenly listen to you to really identify what are the priorities in terms of areas and in terms of uh, research topics that we could pick uh, for taking uh, deeper insights through the work of NIHA. Uh, that's a grand challenge as, as the President uh, Chorchuan mentioned, uh, we, we have uh, high aspirations for the forum itself. Let me uh, share with you what is my own thinking um, and how we structured the forum for, for this uh, day and a half. Um, as you know, uh, uh, my background is, is on water when I, when I first uh, came into uh, the public uh, practitioner arena. Uh, with the comfort of the minister setting the stage, I can also declare I'm not a medical doctor, I'm an engineer, practitioner, uh, an economist, and so I do not claim to know the medical side of all the things that we'll be discussing today. However, I'm very comforted that uh, one of the things we did, uh, and this provides a context, I think, when we were doing the water policy advocacy in the region, um, we, for the first time, were able to make uh, a declaration that... Uh, for the future of uh, water problems in Asia, while well, there are many problems, the many of the Asian countries do not have portable drinking water, proper sanitation, and so on, we were able to confirm, based on our studies, that the problems are not really due to any technology that is lacking or even lack of financing that is needed to actually solve all those problems. It was about lack of proper management and approaching the problems appropriately. And that gave a lot of positive messaging. So we were able to give the message that the problems are solvable, but we need to work at them in a strategic manner, learning from good practice examples that are there around and within the region itself. If I may stretch that uh, with your permission, maybe one of the things that I can provoke you in the day and a half is that I believe looking at what is happening uh, within Asia and in various countries and as we heard even today in the morning of some pockets of examples and success stories, the problems relating to health in Asia are also solvable. But we may need to look at what are the policy decisions that we may need to embrace, or we may need to look at what kind of technology solutions that we may need to adapt, and more importantly, what are the behavioral aspects that we may need to bring. Um, I'll give you one example as how I intersected with the health policy experts. In 2005, I was involved in promoting better water and sanitation in Asia, and as being from the bank, I was trying to put more dollars on the table, convincing the governments to prioritize water policy and put the first dollars into water policy and water projects and so on. There we came up with the 
analysis and the study which confirmed that, that every dollar that you put in water and sanitation has potential health and other economic benefits which are about seven to ten dollars. So it's a fantastic bankable solution. For a dollar you get seven to ten dollars benefit. But no extra dollar really came on the table. <laughs> so then I tried to reverse this corollary saying that for every dollar that is not invested in water and sanitation, what are the negative benefits, the negative externalities in terms of how it affects health and how it affects economic well-being. Now that is where we were able to get some convergence. Then in 2008, the United Nations, the international body, agreed to launch the International Year of Sanitation. Now many of the multilateral institutions are advocating government to prioritize water and sanitation investment because we now see the social and economic dividend of putting first dollars in water and sanitation. Now this we can stretch one step further. What we see in Asia is a striking contrast of economic prosperity on one side and poverty and deprivation and not available basic services and so on. Now how do we get the balance of the prosperity being divided and then it can be distributed in a manner that it brings a larger and sustainable economic and social wealth. Now that's where I want to look at a question as what is the future of health in Asia? We all see that as nations are getting wealthier, we want to make people wealthier, that means, but what is happening is on one hand we see study which shows that the wealthier nations are not necessarily healthier or even within societies the wealthier people are also not necessarily healthier but on the other hand the people who are poor they are affected by infectious and other diseases where they are not able to really get or get a share of the economic wealth that is created within the nation so they because they are not able to get employment or, or not able to access education and others because they are not healthy to really jump the threshold. Now there are studies that show that projections are there for the economic prosperity of the region. There's one study I'm familiar with. By 2039, India is expected to become a $20,000 per capita economy. Now this is very uh, promising and uh, aspirational story, but I wonder as a practitioner, how would that be possible without basic things like water, sanitation, and basic health care being solved or even addressed? How would you reach the trajectory? What are the missing links or what are the roadblocks out there? Now, if we look at the studies that is coming out, much of the solutions that is currently available, mostly drawn from Western experience in terms of universal health care and insurance policies and so on, these are not scalable or replicable in that same manner just because of size, sheer size demands that those kind of solutions cannot be translated or transported. So then we resort to solutions which are mostly behavioral oriented. Now this is where I, I see that there is something that we could draw from the rich experience that is available in these large societies and also the history of Asia itself. Asia, as the minister was saying that, you know, has also a spiritual orientation to lots of things, how we distribute wealth, how we share things with others. So one way I like to propose is maybe using the word uh, health itself. I mean, NIHA is already an acronym. I'm a favorite of several acronyms. Maybe let's go deeper thinking into the word health itself. To me, the way I look at health, the first two letters talk to me about habits and education. Lots of good health come from good habits, but we usually take that as a private or personal behavior and approach health more in a clinical way. When people fall sick, that's when you talk about health, but we never understand how good health comes. In my view, good health is all about habits. And this is not trivial. When the SARS and H1N1 came, one of the basic interventions that governments have to go was just to remind people and check, are you washing your hands after you use the toilet? As a simple thing as that. But that meant a lot in terms of avoiding the communication of the disease. Then comes A and L. To me, that is about how we work and what's our lifestyle. Today, while we enjoy the proliferation and propagation of internet and other uh, electronic technologies, the workplace is invading our personal lives tremendously, that we just cannot stop using our emails, we are working all the time. In a sense, the lifestyle balance has deteriorated in such a manner that the 24 hours of time that we have, 
deprives ourselves of sleep, deprives and invades all other private priorities, including time for family, time for children. So that is impacting, creating stresses. And we only realize it when it comes to a disease or a chronic impact on our own lifestyle. By the time it's already too late. Food, for example. My colleague Chia Ki Singh tells me that 9 out of 14 meals many Asians eat outside. That means you've kind of outsourced your culinary or uh, health inputs because someone else is cooking the food for you and if you fall sick it's really not your fault but you just bought that food. So how do we control all that? means we need really quality time to really manage our own personal health. Then comes the last two letters and here's where the spiritual aspect comes. Good health is all about happiness. It's what kind of thoughts we have and how do we think about ourselves and the society. And so far we've been taking this as something private and we don't want to talk about it un unless somebody really gets into some kind of mental illness or depression. But Asian society is always lauded about this personal behavior where we want to enlighten ourselves. And I was happy somebody talked about enlightened doctors and uh, the minister talked about enlightened politicians. So enlightenment at individual level maybe something that we want to aspire for. So I'm hoping that using the NIHA initiative we will also talk about some of the aspects which go beyond the traditional health sector perspective but look at other things that we need to look at if we really want to look at long-term health to be achieved in Asia. And I want to uh, stop here for a moment because we need time for the eminent speakers who will be talking to us. And I really look forward to the day and a half because I think a lot that I will personally learn from each one of you. And I, we want to have a good dialogue and good interaction. A word of uh, request and a comment to the representatives from the various countries who have come all the way here. We're very grateful to you that uh, you've taken the time away from your work to come here. But we want to uh, request you that please contribute and talk to us because we want to listen to you, not just lecture to you uh, what we want to share with you. So we want to have this day and a half very interactive and a dialogue and we will have facilitators to help you. Uh, and I look forward to the day and a half. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Professor Sitaram. Our first presentation of the day will be made by Professor Zimit, who will speak on non-communicable diseases in Asia, the underappreciated burden. I would now like to invite Professor Paul Zimit, Director Emeritus and Director International Research at Baker IDI Heart and Diabetes Institute, Melbourne, Australia, to please make his presentation. So thank you very much. Um, I was really thrilled to be invited to what uh, I think is going to be a very exciting meeting. It's always a challenge to give the first talk after lunch, <laughs> but I'd, I'd like to thank Professor Sitaram and uh, KS for the invitation to open the meeting. I hope I can keep you awake. So the um, Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Ban Ki-moon, is uh, quoted as having said that diabetes is a public health emergency uh, emerging in slow motion. Um, as you'll all be aware, chronic diseases actually account for something like 60% of all deaths worldwide and some 80% of these deaths actually occur in low or middle income countries where the toll is completely disproportionate and is affecting people in the prime years of their life. These data are slightly outdated, they're a few years old, but the total NCD expenditure on NCDs um, back in 2002 constituted something like 3.5% um, of the total WHO budget. Um, in terms of World Bank loans, it was about 2.5%. It's potentially crept up to 3 or 4% by now. But again, in terms of the overall global picture uh, against the, uh, the communicable diseases, clearly NCD have been badly uh, done by. And I think a big question is uh, why is it that the NCDs, uh, in the face of what is now a burgeoning a global a threat uh, that the message has not got through to the, the major uh, funding agencies such as the United Nations 
and WHO. And we in the diabetes field, I guess, uh, felt um, hard done by, but we have to look, uh, as shown in this, this slide, as a whole group of other global issues um, which have to be put up against diabetes and the NCDs as priorities. And in most of the developing nations now, there is this double burden of infectious diseases um, and chronic diseases, and I'm going to address uh, this issue during the presentation, but you can see here the story of HIV, AIDS, malaria, uh, natural disasters as the recent tsunami, tsunamis, I should say, uh, emerging diseases such as SARS that have been spoken about and uh, bird flu, the urban drift. Um, uh, Professor Cedaram is very interested in the water situation, which clearly uh, is a challenge to us, global climate change, uh, and particularly poverty, where there is a very strong linkage between uh, the communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases, which I'll talk about through the poverty and the social dislocation. Oops. So one of the challenges we face is the fact that the UN Millennium um, Development Goals virtually ignored the non-communicable diseases. And in fact, I've listed those goals and whitened, in fact, the, uh, the goals there which in fact in some way or another do impact on non-communicable diseases. And you could almost... Um, say that all of them, uh, the HIV, there is a link between HIV and type 2 diabetes, which I'll mention, uh, so that this is something that we need to address, and I'll come back to this during my presentation. Um, a big thing for diabetes was in 2006 when there was a unanimous motion at the General Assembly, it's probably one of the few resolutions that have been unanimously passed at the General Assembly. I think HIV AIDS also was listed as a major chronic disease threat and on November the 14th every year now we have World United Nations World Diabetes Day and uh, blue is the diabetes colour and you can see here the Sydney Opera House lit up and the Leaning Tower of Pisa. On November the 14th this year, just a couple of weeks ago, the main United Nations um, diabetes celebrations were held at the Great Wall of China. And I think you've got a pretty good idea here. Um, I was looking for some of my friends in the crowd there, but they're a bit hard to find. But it's certainly uh, an initiative now which has highlighted um, the problem of diabetes globally. And to follow through with this, the next step is a resolution May of this year at the United Nations, calling on a major summit for non-communicable diseases, which will be held in uh, Geneva um, in, uh, I think, September of next year. I'll again come back to that towards the end of my presentation. So there has been this build-up of initiative through diabetes now onto non-communicable disease to try and get it onto the international stage. Um, our institute undertakes the global predictions for diabetes, and I have actually uh, had a, an article handed out which gives you the latest predictions from our institute, but these are the Guinness Book's top ten nations for prevalence of diabetes. And you'll note here the Pacific Island of Nauru has by far the highest prevalence of diabetes, something like one-third of the adult population, very high rates of diabetes now uh, in the Gulf States. Singapore doesn't do so well. You can see Singapore is there uh, at number seven um, and uh, Indian Ocean state of Seychelles. These are a, a few years ago now. The Seychelles has now been tipped out by Mauritius where we're, we're doing our work and I'll mention that to you. These are the global hotspots for diabetes, the Caribbean, uh, Asia, uh, the Gulf states, Africa and the Pacific ocean and uh, diabetes, the highest rate of diabetes in the world is in the country of Nauru and one of our local newspapers when I first reported the Nauru rates uh, ran a story called Western Killer in Paradise about diabetes. Unfortunately they put my photograph there and, 
and, and, and the message was lost. But, but, but diabetes is still you know, a huge burden in the Pacific and, um, as I'll mention to you, in Asia. Now, only two years ago, our former Prime Minister, who just got thrown out recently, our Mandarin-speaking Prime Minister, commented on data from our group pointing out that by 2020, diabetes will be the leading cause of diabetes in Australia in men and only second to breast cancer in women. Uh, he's now been thrown out by um, Julia Gillard, our new Prime Minister, who we hope will keep up the diabetes momentum. Um, my group's been undertaking work in Mauritius uh, over the last 20 years or so, starting in 1987. And Mauritius is very interesting because it's a nation, an island nation of about 1.3 million people uh, with Asian Indian population, Chinese and Creole or, or, South a or African black. So these people constitute two-thirds of the world population. So anything that happens in Mauritius does give you a global perspective and over the period of time we've been surveying in Mauritius, five surveys, there's been a 62% increase in diabetes. And this is a nation also with very high rates of other NCDs, uh, such as cardiovascular disease. And we undertake the global predictions for diabetes. Um, they are in the paper that you've just seen, so I won't go into them in any detail. But there are something like 290 million people with diabetes in the world now. It's going to increase to about 440 million by 2030, but 60% plus of those people are actually in the uh, Asian Pacific region. So this is very much the epicenter of the epidemic uh, for diabetes, and cardiovascular disease is not far behind. This slide just shows you for four Asian countries, India, China, Malaysia, and Singapore, the rise in diabetes over successive surveys, and at the top it shows the increase in the, the gross national productivity. So you see here that with increasing economic growth, this phenomenal rise in diabetes in these nations. In the early 2000s, I jokingly said diabetes rivaled the Dow Jones index. It was a very good indicator, but of course the Dow Jones took a bit of a plunge, but Diabetes has continued to increase. These are the countries with the 10 highest numbers of people with diabetes. And you can see here our predictions uh, were that India had the most with about 40 million and China was just behind then the USA. Well, a report in the New England Journal of Medicine about four months ago actually shows that China now has 90 million people with diabetes, so it's actually gone ahead of India. Um, and um, when you consider there are another 100 million people with what we call pre-diabetes, which is a two-fold risk for cardiovascular disease like diabetes, you can see the potential for a huge cardiovascular epidemic uh, in China. And you can see here in this slide the increase in diabetes uh, in China over the period 1980 through to 2002 and that little bump at the top of 6.4% uh, of the latest survey data um, from um, the Chinese group that was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. Unfortunately, Professor Lenong was not able to join us. He's the president of the Chinese Diabetes Society, but he is very keen to be involved in this initiative and to be involved in potential prevention activities for diabetes. And I'm not going to show you Indian data, but you can read it all in the Herald Tribune and you could read it in a, an, an article by Jason Gale in the Bloomberg uh, publication just a month or so again that um, India is very much crippled by the sugar disease, formerly the top nation in the world, but as The Economist points out, the contest of the century is between China and India for the most people with diabetes, but at the moment China is way out in front. And this here just shows you just one complication of diabetes, kidney disease, the prevalence of kidney complications, 
and the country with the, the highest rate there again is, is Nauru. Australia is in white and Singapore is somewhere in the middle of those yellow uh, bands there. But the complications from diabetes, although very poorly reported in Asia so far, and again this is another need for proper databases, is certainly something we should be thinking of. I just wanted to refer, Ted wanted to be an expert on obesity yesterday, so I thought I'd put this slide up for you, Ted, just to point out, this is the prevalence of central abdominal obesity, which is the biggest risk form of obesity. It's not too bad to have obesity peripherally, but if you have it in your stomach, it's a high risk factor for heart disease and diabetes. And the Americans uh, have certain criteria, and if you look just at the men over there, the yellow um, shows in Chinese, Malays and Indians in Singapore the prevalence of central obesity. But that's by the American criteria where, of course, nearly everyone in America is fat. If you actually apply criteria that we use for Asia, which are lesser, Asians at lower central obesity are at the same risk as Europeans at much higher rates. So when you actually compare and you look then in the blue here, they are the prevalence of central obesity in Singapore, in the different ethnic groups, are reflecting, of course, this major difference in interpreting uh, what is a major risk factor for heart disease and diabetes. And while we just talk about doing surveys and counting the number of people with diabetes, we have to factor in now that diabetes is linked to other disorders. There's a very close association with sleep apnea, for example, and this is a huge cost in productivity of car crashes, truck crashes, people losing their fingers in industrial accidents, um, aeroplane captains going asleep at the wheel and the plane flies over the airport or crashes. So the, this is one uh, confounder from diabetes. Another is that the therapies for HIV AIDS indeed can cause obesity, type 2 diabetes and other metabolic disorders accentuating the epidemic. The drugs that we use, the antipsychotic drugs, can cause high cholesterol, uh, obesity, diabetes. And now, as where before, alcohol was the commonest cause of cirrhosis of the liver, or liver death, I would say. Now, obesity and diabetes through fatty infiltration uh, are likely to be the commonest causes of liver uh, cirrhosis and failure uh, over the next few um, decades. So the cost of diabetes is enormous, and it's not just the cost of medical care, it's the cost from premature mortality and morbidity. Uh, I've just put up here the cost, the latest costs of diabetes in America are over $134 million. I think George Washington anticipated this. Someone said that we should anticipate the future. He anticipated it a long time ago. One of the issues I think we'll be facing is the prevention of diabetes and associated non-communicable diseases. Now, when we start to think about prevention, there are a number of studies now in China, the United States, Finland, that show that if people exercise, people at high risk of diabetes exercise, lose weight, you can reduce by 50% uh, the diabetes uh, recurrence rates. But in Asia and other developing areas, you can see this whole list of other issues which relate to the diabetes epidemic. I'll come back to prenatal and perinatal factors in a minute. Most cases of diabetes, anything up to four or five undiagnosed cases for every diagnosed case exists in Asia. There's the socioeconomic and poverty issues, the education, unemployment, environmental issues. Uh, Siderman, I discussed yesterday the importance of proper urban planning and development. Um, is there access to care? And actually, chronic diseases enhance poverty, but equally so, poverty can enhance chronic disease. And 
pertinent to this is a new perspective we have about the diabetes epidemic. I'm sure you're all aware of the story of the Winter Dutch Famine, where just after World War II, the actual rations were something like, uh, I think, four to 600 calories. Mothers who bore children at that time, um, when those children were studied in adult life, they had more diabetes, more obesity, more heart disease, more hypertension, and indeed mental disturbances such as schizophrenia. So what happens during the mother's pregnancy is very important in determining future risk of chronic disease. And in fact, this was highlighted in Time magazine about four weeks ago, how the first nine months shaped the rest of your life, how the behaviour of the mother, the diet, whether she has an infection, whether she has poor diet, um, actually can affect the risk of the child in later life developing these NCDs. And these genetic changes, the epigenetic changes, are intergenerational, so they get transmitted on in a vicious circle. And so the emphasis now should be to go back um, to be spending a lot more time thinking about um, maternal and child health, which of course was one of the Millennium Development Goals. And Cambodia gives a modern example of what probably happened in Holland then, 30, 40 years ago with the Pol Pot regimen and the poor nutrition and all these other factors. And we now see prevalence rates of diabetes in Cambodia, which are slightly less than in Singapore, but very similar to what we see in Australia. So finally, I just wanted to mention to you this new NCD Alliance of the International Diabetes Federation, the United International Council for Cancer, the World Heart Federation, and Dave and I were just talking about this, the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease. This alliance has been formed to get onto the table in the hardest possible manner uh, the case for more attention to NCDs. These are the members of the alliance. There are 880 member associations in more than 170 countries, so it's a very powerful political force. There will be a high-level United Nations meeting in September 2011 uh, with invitations to heads of state and to try and get uh, the uh, NCD story linked to the newly revised Millennium Development Goals. Um, this just mentions the, um, the four demands that will be uh, put on the table by the NCD Alliance, raising the whole profile of NCDs, uh, their management and prevention within the newly described Millennium Development Goals. Um, the vision for the NCD Alliance uh, are listed here. Um, the Global Action Plan for NCDs, NCD National Plans for All Countries, Improved Lifestyles, a Tobacco-Free World, Strengthening of Health Systems, and Global Access to Affordable and Good Quality Medicines. So, in conclusion, uh, Chaos said that we could have two or three conclusions. Chaos, I've taken the liberty of four. One is that the prevalence of diabetes and other NCDs is continuing to escalate and this region of the world is the epicentre and a very good reason for the Global uh, Alliance uh, Institute to be bringing uh, onto the scene uh, NIHA, that lifestyle change and globalisation have been thought to be the main drivers but as I've mentioned to you, the importance of maternal nutrition, uh, perinatal period, etc., is a very fundamental thing that we have to address in terms of prevention. Uh, the newly described Millennium Development Goals need to address the exploding NCD epidemic uh, in the context of the uh, double burden of diseases in these countries. And of course that the NUS Global Asia Institute can play a very important role in this initiative, perhaps a Davos type uh, uh, thing. And I think that the point that Professor Sidoran mentioned of integrating various disciplines uh, into this, not just health, is very important. So th that's my final message, but I think that this slide 
probably also tells the story, Mummy, if we're still only a developing country, why have I got high blood pressure and diabetes? Some of us are more developed than others. Thank you. don't mind, would you stay there so it's easy to take questions? We have about 10 or 15 minutes to have a good round of questions. So I open the floor for questions to Professor Zimet. Yeah, I see show of hands. Please go ahead. Please introduce yourself because some do not know. My name is Peter Little. I uh, work closely with the, um, the uh, Deputy President of Research and Technology here at the university. I wonder if you could just spend a few seconds trying to dissect out the effects of age on uh, non-communicable diseases. Because clearly, uh, age is, uh, those diseases are very correlated with age. The populations are aging. What's the, uh, the variance induced by the change in, in the aging demography, demography compared with the absolute incidence, which I assume is increasing in parallel? Clearly, I didn't have time to give you a one-hour lecture on diabetes and different prevalence rates, but if you look at age-specific prevalence of diabetes, clearly uh, it's incre the, the prevalence increases with age. Now, yes, with ageing of populations, we'll see more diabetes, but equally so... Even in Australia, and particularly in developing nations, whereas type 2 diabetes, which is the form we're mainly talking about, used to be considered, if you go to the English medical textbooks, you didn't get type 2 diabetes till you were 60 years old. We're now seeing type 2 diabetes in children and adolescents, and it was never seen, say, 20 or 30 years ago in the workforce. We're now seeing diabetes in the 35 to 45 year old age group. So yes, you do see more with ageing, but the actual age of onset of type 2 diabetes has moved right down so that, for example, in Japan, type 1 diabetes, so-called childhood diabetes, is less common now than the adult type 2 form of diabetes with this move down uh, of the age of onset. I don't know if that's the sort of question, but the answer you have. Please go ahead. Um, in the Philippines, we have included the NCDs as uh, part of the MDGs. Uh, since last year, we have included this as uh, one of the priorities, and we call it the MDG Max, which means MDGs plus NCDs. Yeah. And it is now being included in our new medium-term development plan. Now, our main problem here is actually the standardization of the indicators and uh, the collection of data because in the past several years or in the past decades, there seems to be no standard uh, reporting system for the NCDs. Most of these are taken from the registries being collected by the specialty societies. And um, this, I think, is the main problem that we are facing in, in the Philippines and probably in other countries as well, if we will be including this in our, our development trust. I don't, think, uh, I don't think there's much I can say except to comment that there are some countries in Asia with very good data on diabetes prevalence, where we do lack information is on the complications of diabetes, which uh, have been mentioned, uh, kidney failure and stroke and heart disease and such like. Um, so I think there's been a, a battle at WHO for a long time now to get people to use standardised survey methodology. And I think, again, one of the functions of the, the institute or this organisation could well be to insist on getting uh, proper uh, data, standardised data. And Professor Sidero mentioned to me yesterday he'd like to model. Am I am I uh, leaking a secret or something? Oh, La go ahead. Like to do some <laughs> modelling activities on the burden and the cost of diabetes uh, in the future, going out maybe 10 or 20 years. Because if you look at the American figures, you can almost guarantee that diabetes, with the way it's going up and other NCDs, is going to bankrupt the economies of many nations 
uh, in the next 20 or 30 years. So someone has to start waving a red flag. In that respect, I wanted to ask you, do you have any idea of the cost actually right now for, the, for some countries in our region of uh, diabetes? Um, I cannot give you them right now, but GSK uh, did um, sponsor a, uh, some sort of study of the cost of diabetes in a number of nations. So I don't know if Christoph can dig out those figures, otherwise I'll go away. I've got the slides on my computer. Um, but it's a study maybe done four or five years ago. I'm interested to know why tuberculosis uh, has become a part of the Non-Communicable Diseases Alliance. What was their reason and, and can you explain a little bit? No, <laughs> there's always someone who asks a question you can't answer. But, but I, think it, I think it's mainly because uh, with the increase of diabetes and the fact TB is right, you know, there, are, there is a link in terms of the uh, risk of uh, infection in people with diabetes and with the increasing diabetes, we're now seeing a recur recurrence of some of the infectious disease epidemics such as TB uh, that uh, had been under control. We, can, we could ring from Chatham House and ask the IDF people, but... Uh, can I um, come back to the Dutch uh, winter famine and also the article in the time? There's a hypothesis uh, that uh, as developing nations undergo very rapid economic growth, that that is too much of a good thing in life for its people. And uh, whereas the, in Europe uh, you have the, uh, undergone this rapid development over generations and therefore the body, the pancreas is served, uh, are able to cope with the sugar levels that is imposed over generation and therefore the trans the transition for the uh, developing uh, nations people is much shorter and therefore this is one of the reason uh, for this uh, epidemic uh, in sugar diabetes. How much of this is known uh, of this uh, hypothesis and if this is really the case, is there really anything that can be done uh, about it? Well, again, I think um, this would take a good debate for about two hours. Uh, have I got two minutes? 30 seconds. The, what you're talking about, the, the, of course, there is a thrifty gene hypothesis that teleologically uh, people in, who went through a feast and famine situation uh, had a genetic advantage, uh, had a gene which allowed them to survive during famines. And this was called the thrifty gene hypothesis. Um, and that now today, in a time of plenty, that gene is no longer an advantage. You get type 2 diabetes. So that's one side of the story. There's this rapid development story, which, you know, I don't think there's one single cause for type 2 diabetes. There's been a huge move now on this whole business of maternal, the, the Dutch famine story, uh, Cambodia, the Australian indigenous people, the mothers with poor nutrition, that in fact the we're putting much more emphasis now on the maternal and child story, a maternal nutrition story. And in fact, here in Singapore, Peter Gluckman, who's one of the world leaders in the area, uh, may be pushing it a bit hard. But um, certainly it's an area where I think in terms of preventing type 2 diabetes, certainly uh, in our societies and in developing countries around here, that education of mothers about proper nutrition during pregnancy and ensuring good nutrition may be an important strategy in preventing type 2 diabetes. I'm happy to have a, over a dinner, if they have a good wine, we could, we could discuss this more. Um, thank you for the, um, the uh, warning signals about this looming uh, pandemic. But uh, if you are referring to, say, uh, diabetes and the rest of the NCDs in the region, uh, how do you advise governments who are dealing with a whole gamut of uh, uh, diseases? It's not just diabetes, it's the, the whole gamut, you know, plus the triple burden of uh, emerging and re-emerging infections. So from a policy perspective, it will have to be back to boiling, boiling it down to uh, priorities that you allocate in a health system, that getting the basics right about the orientation of the health systems, uh, towards a more cost-effective and more towards the prevention of disease rather than the, the treatment uh, and the financing of it 
whether the incentives that you give to the providers you know, are orientated towards the, the preventive aspects rather than the, 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 uh, financing the tail end of the catastrophic illnesses that come in the system. Thank you. Um, I, all I can say is I agree if I could take 30 seconds. Um, the example in Australia is we did the first national, my group, first national survey for diabetes in Australia in the year 2000. We found Australia had a million people with diabetes. We now know there's 1.5 million. In that 10 years, our former treasurer, Peter Costello, recognised not just the medical impact, but the workforce and productivity in the nation. And diabetes is now a top priority for funding. And I think you're right. You have to pick the, uh, the problems that are the biggest at the time, and you do have to make priorities. And I, can, I, I can agree, can't agree with you more. And I'm happy again to discuss that later on because Professor Sitaram wants to move on. Thank you, Professor Zimmet. Our next speaker for the day is Professor David Heyman, Chairman, Health Protection Agency, United Kingdom. I invite Professor Heyman to please make his presentation on the title, Emerging Pandemics Need to Shift from Response to Prevention. Thanks very much. Uh, before I start, I would just say that um, emerging infections are very important in two areas of, of the health system. One is for the healthcare workers who are clearly at greatest risk for emerging infections. And the second is in the health systems themselves which are overwhelmed um, by inf emerging infections many times. And also resources are taken away from health systems to deal with those emerging infections. Second, if we are to shift from emergency response to prevention, if we are to change the paradigm in our response to emerging infections, there are four things we have to do, and we talked about those this morning as being uh, very important to this uh, uh, initiative, and those are an integrative approach, making sure that all sectors are involved, using um, our databases to understand what's going on in these diseases, using some modeling and simulation, and practical applicability in order to shift this paradigm from emergency response. And finally, um, just to say that though emerging infectious diseases are important, so are non-communicable diseases, and there should never be a discussion about which is more important. They're all important for different reasons, and we have to deal with them all. So I just start by talking about some of the emerging infections um, that have appeared since 1976, or at least been identified since 1976. And you can see them uh, on this slide. Uh, they, they range from Ebola, which is probably the most dramatic, through HIV, which is one of the most important, if not the most important, infectious disease today, through SARS and influenza H1N1. Now, when these infections emerge, as you know, there are many different pathways. The first pathway could be no further transmission. An infection causes a disease but doesn't transmit further. A clear example being rabies. The second is one that continues transmission for a short while but then ceases and remains sporadic. A good example is H5N1, which has been shown to transmit to a few, in a few clusters from person to person, but usually cease or it does cease and becomes sporadic. And then there's the third emergence, which can continue transmission. It can continue to a pandemic, and then eventually it becomes endemic, and H1N1 is a good example, or AIDS, another good example, HIV, of diseases that have become endemic after emergence. And at the same time, their virulence may increase or decrease. We can't tell from the initial emergence what that will look like as it passes through humans into possibly a new form. We know that emerging infections are fairly well distributed throughout the world, and you can hear, see here the uh, work done by Jones in Nature in uh, 2008. And Jones also indicated that these emerging infections come from four different sources, parasites, fungus, virus, and bacteria. So all four of these agents are important in emerging infections. Now, emergence occurs clearly from wild animals in nature, and the echo challenge just up here in Malaysia in 2000 is a good example of that. 
This was a triathlon when there were swimmers, jungle running, and mountain biking. And there was no indication that leptospirosis would be transmitted in this area, as is shown here on a sign from the U.S. However, somehow athletes did become infected with leptospirosis, probably swimming through the rivers. And they took the disease home with them. Uh, 33 of them, actually, out of 312, became infected. Now, this is one of those diseases that emerges but doesn't spread from person to person. Fortunately, there were not epidemics. These were the athletes who took the disease home. Some of them died because they were misdiagnosed. In addition, emergence also occurs in domestic poultry, and it's clear that this happened in Hong Kong in the H5N1 influenza pandemic, epidemic rather, in 1997, the first time that H5N1 was identified in humans, 18 human infections, six deaths. It was clear that this virus was both in ducks and chickens. Ducks were the healthy carriers, chickens the unhealthy recipients who received it and got sick in the wet markets. And the result was culling. Responding to a disease first identified in humans, culling the animals, stopping the disease. And H5N1 has continued to spread throughout Asia. As you know, it still continues today. And the question in 2010 is, will adaptive mutation occur in other mammals, as was hypothesized in the 1918 pandemic? Or will there be a sudden reassortment as occurred in 1957 and 1968. Questions that remain unknown, very important for emerging infections, very important for health workers and health systems. Another emergence from farmed wild animals, so now we have wild animals in nature, domesticated poultry, and farmed wild animals thought to have been the source of the SARS coronavirus. Suspected animals in the chain of transmission were the civet cat, um, and this is thought to have been a one-time event, a one-time mutation, which first of all occurred in China. Uh, you can see it was very difficult to identify early on because of the fact that it was occurring sporadically. But once it got into health workers, the light gray, it then amplified its transmission and was able to spread into the communities in China. This then took off from the airport in Hong Kong and spread around the world through tourists who stayed overnight in the same hotel where a health worker from the Guangdong province stayed overnight one night on his way to a wedding. This caused a worldwide epidemic, which fortunately stopped. It possibly was contained by the travel recommendations that affected Singapore, Hong Kong, and other places very much. It did stop. Fortunately, it didn't become a zoonotic disease endemic in animals or in humans. And finally, in addition to wild, farmed wild domestic poultry, there are domestic ruminant animals that also can transmit diseases to humans. And the most classic one is the emergence of bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Where the fence is, shows that when carcasses of ruminants are used to make animal feed, it shouldn't go on to other ruminants, it should stop. But in the case of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, it didn't stop, and the process in that cauldron in the middle was changed in such a way that the rendering was done at a lower temperature, permitting infective protein or prions to pass through into animal feed, causing an epidemic of bovine spongiform encephalopathy in the UK cattle. And in 1996, after it was realized that this could infect humans as well, there was a ban on British beef. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy in humans comes directly, somehow or indirectly, from cattle into humans, causes a very serious and fatal disease. And it caused an epidemic in the United Kingdom caused a great amount of economic damage from culling of those animals and was spread around the world through other products, cattle included, that were taken and traded before it was realized that this 
infection could infect humans. And the result was that variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease has occurred in many countries throughout the world. Now, the current paradigm, as you've seen, is detecting emerging infections first in humans and then identifying and culling the animal source, a very difficult economic situation for many countries. Now, the paradigm is beginning to change, and this is especially so with One Health, which is a partnership that's forming between human and animal medicine. One Health working at the interface of human and animal infections. Now, this One Health agenda calls for many things, but one of those is increased use of animal vaccines when it's shown to be cost-effective, stronger regulation of animal husbandry, identifying emerging animal infections, assessing their risk to humans, as is done on the left there, which is um, from the United Kingdom, showing that two infectious diseases in animals are being watched and being assessed by both the veterinary departments and the public health departments to determine whether or not it's a risk to humans. Then joint surveillance activities and research are conducted afterwards and a sharing of laboratory specimens between animal and public health. An important change in the paradigm to One Health, working together between animal and human sectors. But the question is, can the paradigm be pushed back even further? And this is the cover of a meeting report from Chatham House earlier this year when there was an examination of emerging infections to see whether or not there were possibilities of preventing these diseases at the source. And there are certainly many determinants of emergence. There's risky and unregulated trade, as is shown here on the left, when exotic birds were being imported into Belgium illegally, were found at the customs, were examined and found to be carrying healthy carriers of H5N1, and wild game animals being farmed that themselves can carry um, infections. Other determinants of emergence are unregulated animal husbandry, and greater human contact as a result, showing in range, in village free range cattle without the appropriate immunizations or vaccinations, and bark backyard poultry production, which occurs throughout the world, including in Asia. Also, determinants of emergence are risky water management and interspecies contamination. Here, what you see in the upper left is cattle who are being treated with antibiotics, developing resistant strains and resistant gene, uh, genes and cassettes that are going into a water holding lagoon, um, which then seeps into the soil and into groundwater and surface water that then has the risk of infecting humans. So it's very important, and other animals. So it's very important that also risky water management be undertaken and interspecies contamination be avoided if possible. And finally, other determinants are close domestic wild animal contact. On the left, you see a fruit bat and a pig. This is thought to be the potential, the possible mechanism for the infection of pigs in the Philippines with rest on Ebola virus. And it's also thought to be somehow related, bats are somehow thought to be related to the emergence of Nipah in pigs and in, in humans. And on the right, you can see transfrontier conservation areas where fences have been put up to try to prevent this interspecies mingling of free-range cattle and animals in Eastern Africa. And finally, for determinants of emergent are intensive agriculture, especially if done in unsanitary conditions. Finally, the last and one of the most important potential determinants of emergent, emergence is climate change and health itself. Now, we've clearly had glimpses of what will happen when climate change becomes even more important in the world. We've seen the increase in violence of storms, flooding, droughts, and other phenomena associated with temporary weather or climate inversions. And Rift Valley fever in Sudan in 1998 in the east of Africa gives us a glimpse of what might be happening as these weather events become more and more important. 
because in 1998, in East Africa, there was El Nino flooding. And that flooding forced animals, cattle, ruminants, and humans to live closer together on dry land. And at the same time, it provided for mosquito breeding. So it was a perfect environment where there was increased mosquito breeding, especially the Aedes, and humans and animals closer together. In addition, animal husbandry at that time was lacking. This shows you a vaccination of, uh, of cattle for Rift Valley fever, but there was insufficient veterinary vaccine production and use in East Africa in the 1990s. So all those cattle that were closer to humans, many of them were carrying the Rift Valley fever virus but had not, and had not been protected. In addition, because animal husbandry is so important in Sudan, it's very important port at Port Sudan transports cattle across the Red Sea. It transports them in larger vessels, which is legal traffic, which has vaccinated cattle, but it also transfers sheep and others in smaller vessels, many times clandestinely. And this occurs especially at the times of religious sacrifices and pilgrimages. So the perfect setting, which actually did transfer Rift Valley fever out of East Africa the first time into Saudi Arabia and Yemen in 2000 through animals that were taken for religious sacrifice and were not vaccinated, causing a major outbreak of Rift Valley fever in humans and endemicity in cattle and ruminants in Yemen. So where are we today? Well, the current paradigm, as we talked, is detection and containing emerging infections in humans, then identifying the animal source and containing it at the animal source. The paradigm is beginning to change to detect first in animals, assess the risk in humans, and attempting to intervene before emergence through the One Health Agenda. And hopefully the future paradigm, and one in which this group can work, is preventing domestic and wild animal infection at the source by modifying the determinants and intervening before emergence. What will that take? Well, it will take health policies and financial resources that favor research in understanding the determinants of domestic and wild animal infection. It will take research and development, new animal vaccines, other means of protection, including changing human behavior, especially in backyard raising of animals, modeling of cost effectiveness, identifying which interventions could most effectively modify determinants using vaccines and tools we have today and those that will become available in the future, understanding the political barriers to this, studying the feasibility of implementing the most cost effective interventions, and finally overcoming those barriers by engaging the public and politicians in the best possible animal husbandry and wildlife management, wildlife management. So a whole shift in the paradigm from detecting in humans to preventing animal infections. So I hope I've been able to convince you in a few minutes that emerging infections are important, important for healthcare workers, important for health systems, and important for us as we move ahead in trying to push back the paradigm to begin to prevent those diseases at the source. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have 10 minutes for several questions to Professor Heyman. I have three, uh, two hands, yeah. Um, thanks, David, uh, for a very revealing talk. Um, I have just two um, simple questions. First one is, does the One Health Initiative include how to tackle um, antibiotic use in animals giving rise to multi-resistant organisms affecting humans? And then the second question is really, um, as I see it, a lot of these, you know, um, emerging diseases would happen in poor countries where um, there is a lot of animal, you know, human contact, but uh, these are exactly the places where there are lack of resources, you know, to implement um, effective interventions. So um, I do understand that um, during the um, past few years, there's been a lot of, you know, um, initiatives from richer countries 
or um, international foundations or you know Gates Foundation, etc., to try and help these uh, um, poor countries and, and come up with some solutions. How do you envisage you know the um, how, how things will pan out? Um, will such initiatives be successful, and what other structures would be helpful in um, um, getting us to a further level in reducing the emergence of um, new diseases? Thanks, Thomas. Let me uh, let me start with the the first on antimicrobial resistance. Yes, this is a very important part of the One Health agenda, and um, as you know. Um, WHO back in the 1990s um, conducted some meetings which clearly showed that there was a risk to humans from animal infections that were resistant, looking at zoonotic infections in both animals and humans and seeing parallel increases, especially in Denmark and Netherlands where there was good data. Um, that resulted in the ban of, in Europe, of anti microbial agents that are used in humans and animals. In parts of Asia, that unfortunately still continues as it does in North America where antibiotics are used to replace sanitary agriculture many times to help animals grow uh, more rapidly and more robustly. So it's a very difficult issue uh, and it's one that, that is difficult because animals and humans are different. Animals are raised for money, humans are raised to contribute to society. And so it's a very, very difficult issue. But it's one that the One Health Agenda is addressing and must address. Emerging infections in poor countries. Again, it's very difficult to get ministries of agriculture and ministries of health to work together. In Sudan, uh, it was very clear that agriculture wanted nothing to do with this outbreak occurring in humans. They didn't want anyone to deal with their animals. There is hope, though, in the international health regulations which require core capacity in public health in developing countries because that core capacity can then be applied to infections, emerging infections. But it's very difficult to get the um, departments of agriculture to work with health. In UK, it's occurred. UK is one of the exemplary countries because of that. But they've suffered from many, many veterinary diseases, animal diseases, which have cost their economy much money and they've learned that they need to work together. Hopefully that will happen without that pain in other countries. Uh, since I was in Singapore at the time of the SARS experience, I was particularly interested in the shape of that curve you showed of, of the incidence. And there was a steep spike and then it decrease in one. Is there a cause and effect for that? Um, that intermediate spike after which it went down and then it went up again? Yeah, the second spike was due to Canada, which thought they had gotten rid of the disease and hadn't, and it went back up. Singapore and Hong Kong were uh, dealing with it quite well, yeah. and China. I'm stimulated by the comparison between the claims that you just made about the importance of your area as opposed to Paul's uh, complaints about the inattention to his area. If you had 10 minutes with a Minister of Health in one of the nations that you both are interested in, and you both were there, how would you describe the, the allocation between measures to do something about the problems you're thinking about as opposed to the ones that Professor Zimmet's talking about? You know, this-, this 10 minutes. This goes back to the 1990s, actually, because in the 1990s, the non-communicable disease people in the World Bank report that came out in 1990 were clearly shown to have a greater importance. And they didn't work this agenda the way they needed to, and as a result, the emerging infections agenda came in on top of it and took over. But back in the 1990s with the dailies and the uh, World Health Re or the report by the World Bank, non-communicable diseases were on the top. So what I would tell the minister is that you need to keep both these diseases on top. You need to watch for them for different reasons. You need to strengthen your resilience. You need to make sure that you're addressing multi-sectorally the determinants of disease for animals and humans. And you need to do the same thing with non-communicable diseases. You need to work with all the different sectors. And there's one is not more important than the other. Well, I, 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 know, I know that's the 
a possible answer, but I was trying to press you to deal with a fixed budget, and you're not responding to that. I and am I think responding. That's, and I think that's the biggest problem when we enumerate difficulties out there in the world and people face fixed budget, there's an opportunity cost that I think has to be responded to. I, I appreciate that the, the importance of beginning with not neglecting either one, but if you're thinking about this as an area to be researched, an area to be proposed, to be discussed, trade-offs are crucially important. And I think those trade-offs are many times political. The, the, the political agenda after the SARS outbreak was one of preparing for the next one, even though these things may not occur very often. And that was a political agenda that in many ways overtook the common sense agenda of good health in an equilibrium. And so political decisions are many times more important, and I'm not going to back down. They're both equally important, and I would try to sell that to the minister. Colleague from Myanmar wants to ask. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> uh, thanks, Chairman and uh, Professor David. So, by viewing this uh, slide and other research and development, you mentioned only the new animal vaccines. What about the human vaccines? Do you have the, any reasons to not mention about the human vaccines? Thanks. No, that's a, that's a good point. And actually, there are groups that are out looking for um, that holy grail vaccine, for example, for influenza, which would have all the different avian strains in it or all the different strains. So yes, human vaccines would also be very important. It's an omission. Peter? Many of the risks that you're discussing are, are conjectural. And um, I think as, a, as an educator and as a scientist, the H1N1 uh, discussion was, um, it probably wasn't science's finest hour at predicting the future. The risks were clearly those of the 1918 epidemic and the, out, the outcome was somewhat, uh, somewhat less than that. Uh, it seems to me to be an area that we actually, we actually educate the public rather poorly about. We give the public the, the very strong message, it's peer review, it's peers saying we need a billion dollars to be spent on, on um, influenza research and the people who benefit are the people who are making the claims that it will be extreme. So is this, is this an area that we can also explore? It's simply how do we tell people what a conjectural risk is and how bad it is, and does that help politicians then make decisions in some of these extremely complex areas that you've just been discussing? You know, the, the risk is, is unknown in most of these instances. When a new organism emerges, the risk is, is completely unknown, and so recommendations have to be the most severe. As more information is collected, they can become less severe, but they're still an unknown. I think in selling these things to the public, it would have been much easier to do two things, to make sure that the modeling that had been done was not put out as possibilities, but only put out as modeling, which is very hard to do. And so the modeling figures went out as facts. The second is, in selling such things as stockpiles, they're merely an insurance policy. And everybody understands that for a house you buy insurance, for a car you buy insurance, and also for a disease you have to buy insurance and you have to invest in these. So it's, it's an investment that was necessary because of the incertitude of what a virus or a bacterium will do and the inability to understand at present what the dynamics are that could change it. But you're right, risk communication was very poorly done uh, in H1N1 in most countries. And as a result, people had great expectations for a, a massive pandemic, which never occurred. And then they began to accuse their politicians of stocking the wrong things or spending too much money. So, okay. yeah. Um, just going on along the lines of what I was asking, I think since we had two very uh, different presentations on uh, two different, uh, very important uh, health problems in the in in the world, it's a question of how, yes, for for the group, the challenge of how are we going to approach in terms of dealing with with issues. One is, of course, by uh, separating by the communicable and, and infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, and infectious diseases. That's one way of doing it. I think the two presentations obviously make us then look in terms of uh, is that the way that we proceed. Another way is really to look at combination of things that uh, one can do in terms of innovative things. Because many health systems look at, uh, or health services, have, we, we have silos, we have programs, which are very effective. 
but we don't integrate them uh, in terms of the public health and curative programs. Even in curative programs, we, we look at uh, rehabilitative, acute, uh, we have primary, secondary, tertiary. So we have a whole elements of division of types of things that we do. And we look at things, we, we cut services by different age groups, pediatric, geriatric, but then we also have problems that go in, in horizontal areas as well. So uh, the question of, uh, that was asked earlier about NCDs, about uh, the, the uh, elderly population, if, if you take a cutoff line of people over 65, there are also NCDs below the age of 65. So you have different dimensions, and this is a problem in terms of as we develop in our sciences. We, are, we have different specialties with our own agendas, and we develop the knowledge base of that. But in society, when you actually integrate all these services to one, how does it work? When we talk prevention, how do we integrate everything together? So that's another approach we could possibly think of. So, yeah. But at the end of the day, if you wanted to have an impact, the impact would be on the policymakers. So we need to understand in terms of if actions need to be taken, they have to be taken by national governments because they have the authority. They have the resources in terms of not just financial resources, but the regular framework, the governance of the whole total system. And these are the important people. So those are the things that we need to look at as well. So I think this, the two presentations gives us this opportunity to look at the approaches in terms of dealing with the issues. And uh, because I'm talking a bit about policy and the, the minister was talking about the science and the art, but it's not just the art, it's the science of the art. So it's a bit like when he was talking about his experiences, uh, there was a context in terms of the decisions were made. So we, we in, in, in science, we ignore everything else as non-science or art, as emotions, as politics. We disregard it, we, uh, we don't respect it, but in fact, the politics, policy is, is political in nature. Uh, a policy is political in nature because it's made by governments, so they're politics. So it's really the other sciences that we need to incorporate in, in our approaches if we really want to have an impact. So my contribution is because having looked at the, how services are run or not run uh, at, properly and how decisions are made or not made. And the issues that we think are important may not be important for the policy makers and that's why they're ignored because we present it in different th ways. We, don't look at, uh, we don't look at the evidence required. Uh, we only look at it from our perspectives and these are the important health issues but those are not the important issues for the for the, uh, the politicians or for the policy makers. They have different agendas. So I think the, the, the problem, of course, that when we deal with these sort of very complex problems is how do we actually, at least we need to understand uh, why they make decisions and why they don't. If we take an approach of a disease base, then uh, even in understanding of the advocacy, because we are really an, an advocacy group of uh, if we are doing biomedical approaches, a focus here in terms of how do we put agenda in com competition with all the other agendas because everyone mm. is, is uh, clamoring the policymakers to get their things solved, their problems that the policymakers have on a daily basis, the demands on, on their time, on their attention. How do we get their attention? So I guess understanding some of the policy I issues helps us in terms of uh, whatever approach we're going to take. Uh, so I, I just want to, to well, share my own thoughts with you. E.K., I think that's useful. And, and what, what you're saying, I believe, is that, that the answer to that Minister of Health would be you need to strengthen your health systems to deal with the non-communicable diseases and to be resilient enough to deal with other diseases that come in in, in, in a larger number. And at the same time, you have to sit with your cabinet and make sure that they understand the determinants of these diseases to work to prevent them, whether it's with the food industry, whether it's with, with the, uh, the agricultural sector or whatever. So maybe it's uh, an enlightened head of state who can get his cabinet to work on the determinants and a minister of health who strengthens his health systems for resilience and for day-to-day -day patient care. Jeremy. Does that answer your question? Well, <laughs> that's what partnership is for. We're networking. <laughs> Sorry, just a very quick comment around the role of uh, really industry also. And I think s something that we haven't emphasized enough is the role of uh, really incentives. I mean, 
why would a poor farmer in any developing country care about antimicrobial resistance? He's busy enough trying to make ends meet. And if the value proposition or the economics don't make sense at all the various levels, we in government, we can pontificate until, terrible pun, but until the cows come home, but it ain't going to make any difference. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> that could be added. Just a quick, quick comment more related to EK's intervention is that one of the problems we face also is the impact, because when you try to convince someone to allocate resources, uh, they will ask you uh, what will be the impact of this allocation of resources. And in that case, and I have, I have this experience, the non-communicable disease would lose, because the impact on the, you, most often, not always, but most often you will have a relatively more faster impact with communicable disease mm -hmm. and non-communicable disease. I say that because it's important that an initiative like NIHA make sure that we do not, again, go into silos and in the research agenda, as uh, mentioned this morning by the President, we must have a holistic approach, taking into account the political constraints, because when you have elections coming and you have to convince your electors that you did something, <laughs> It's much easier to do something. Sorry, David, you know we work together, but it's much easier to work on, uh, on an emerging infectious disease that you can control immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Heyman. Uh, we now move on to the next plenary session um, titled Opportunities for Healthcare Policy Research in Asia. Our third speaker for the day is Dr. Margaret Hamburg, Commissioner, Food and Drug Administration, U.S. Dr. Hamburg will speak on the role of, on the, speak on the role of regulatory science in improving health care for all. I invite Dr. Hamburg to please make her presentation. Well, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, and to be part of this, this gathering here at the National University of Singapore. It's my first time in Singapore, my, my first real day. And so far, I must say, I am really uh, very, very impressed. Um, it's a little bit humbling to follow two such interesting uh, presentations um, and that certainly illustrate some of the complex challenges before us. Hopefully, my remarks will have some bearing on um, at least partial um, solutions to some of the problems uh, raised from a very different perspective. And I guess that an, another um, commonality with the presentations before me is that, that I'm also going to be arguing about inattention to a particular area um, that needs more investment. Um, but I think this is all fodder um, for the NEHA uh, project whose goal is to make a significant contribution to thinking and policy formulation in public health and health systems development in Asia. And this, I think, is really a very well-focused initiative and something that I support wholeheartedly and with enthusiasm, and I'm really delighted to be able um, to be a part of it. And it's very clear to me uh, that NUS is the right institution to undertake this task not only is it the largest university in the country in terms of enrollment and curriculum, but it's also, of course, one of the most prestigious, not just in Asia and in the world. And I'm very impressed by how this university has historically been committed to the promise of strong partnerships with other universities, um, including, I note, some of the best in America, and also partnerships um, across sectors, and how you value innovative leadership, scholarship, and teaching. And I think this initiative clearly re represents another strong opportunity for NUS leadership. And I hope that what I discussed today about the importance of strengthening regulatory science on behalf of patients and the need to engage academia, industry, and government together in this effort will pique your interest. As I'm here in my capacity as Commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, let me first say just a few words about my agency and the perspective that I bring to these discussions. As you may know, the FDA is a science-based regulatory agency with a mission of promoting and protecting the health of the public. 
We're responsible for ensuring that foods, drugs, and medical products meet our scientific safety and quality approval standards before they reach the American people. And we're also responsible for continuing to monitor them for safety and effectiveness even after products reach the marketplace and are in widespread use. We're also responsible for advancing the public health by helping to speed innovations that make medicines and foods safer, more effective, and more accessible, and by helping the public and health care providers get the accurate science-based information that they require to make sound decisions about the use of the products that we regulate. And today, these efforts are more important than ever. Advances in science, coupled with the effects of globalization, have transformed the world in which we live, and particularly the world in which we work to deliver treatments and cures to the people who need them. I think we can all agree that we're witnessing extraordinary breakthroughs in science and technology today. But do we really believe that we're fully harnessing the promise of that science for the benefit of patients in our countries and in our communities? I certainly don't think so. In 2010, there are an unconscionable number of people around the world who do not have what they need for themselves and their families to fight disease and to be healthy. All of us in this room have the responsibility to find solutions, and I'd like to offer one pathway for doing so. From my perspective, we've not seen the progress in treatments and solutions that we should have for even the most widespread of diseases and conditions, in large part because we haven't focused enough attention on what it actually takes to effectively and efficiently translate science scientific discoveries and innovation into real-world products. And unfortunately, the number of new therapies is actually on the decline while the costs of bringing them to market have soared. And there are many reasons, but we know that outdated, inefficient review methods can delay the marketing authorization of critical treatments, and we know that promising therapies may, in fact, be discarded during development because we don't have the tools to recognize their potential. At the same time, significant economic resources and many years may be wasted assessing novel therapies that better tools could have proved unsafe or ineffective at an earlier stage. And of course, some important products don't get developed because the development costs and regulatory uncertainties are high and the prospects for market returns may be low. New knowledge and improved tools could help us address all of these challenges with the result of helping facilitate the development of better products more quickly and at less overall cost. To put it simply, there's an unacceptable gap between advances in science and real improvements in patient care. We need to bridge that gap, and we can. But we must recognize that world-class regulatory systems are as integral to successful health care systems as our world-class basic science research institutions, world-class hospitals and clinics, and world-class health care personnel. They all form a continuum and are, in essence, the building blocks of a successful modern healthcare system. The regulatory component is the linchpin between the results of the investments we as a society put into life sciences research and the development of products based on that science that offer new hope to patients. This is where I believe a new focus on regulatory science comes in. And it is a focus that needs input and commitment from not only regulatory agencies, but also academic institutions, industry, and healthcare leaders and government. Let me explain a little bit more what I mean when I refer to regulatory science. I'm talking about the science of developing new knowledge and tools necessary to assess the safety, efficacy, quality, and performance of drugs and other medical products. It allows us to develop the methods, standards, and models that can speed not just the development, but also the review, marketing authorization, and ongoing regulatory oversight of those medical products. 
These are not proprietary tools or tools that only help one company or one country. These are tools that are in the public domain and that are in the service of all regulators, other scientists, and healthcare professionals. And they inform a whole body of innovation rather than just a single product. A bench scientist may develop a new approach or a more fundamental understanding of a disease. A clinician may be able to show it has the possibility to work. But regulatory scientists must help develop the knowledge and tools to translate discovery and innovation into the safe, effective, quality products that people count on. I should emphasize that regulatory science involves a wide range of disciplines and approaches, including basic science, clinical, epidemiologic, and st statistical tools, as well as technologies such as bioimaging and information technology for information gathering systems. Regulatory science should be viewed as an essential part of the global scientific enterprise. But unfortunately, as a scientific field, regulatory science remains woefully underfunded, underappreciated, and underaddressed by government, by industry, and by academia. And we are left relying on 20th century approaches, not the best available science, for the development, review, and oversight of the treatments and cures of the 21st century. And this is simply unacceptable. We need an invigorated commitment to regulatory science. This is essential to the work of regulators like the FDA and the HSA here in Singapore, but it is really more. It is about building up a key area of science in terms of direct investment, human resources, respect, and recognition so that we can come together as a global scientific research uh, community to more fully harness the possibilities of science today and bridge that critical gap between the promise of science and our ability to actually deliver on it. For those of us involved in this aspect of the global product development and regulation enterprise, I think that much of this is intuitive but perhaps a few specific examples would help make the case here this afternoon more clearly. For one thing, regulatory science can help us usher in the so-called era of personalized medicine. As scientists continue to discover more and more about the human genome, the biomarkers of disease, our, and our body's response to disease, important work is underway to translate that knowledge into the identification, characterization, and qualification of biomarkers for regulatory use. And this is beginning to have some dramatic impacts. For example, we can use regulatory science to optimize delivery and dosing of drugs so that patients receive the most benefit at the lowest risk. A case in point is the updated labeling of warfarin, a widely prescribed anticoagulant drug that can be hard to dose depending on factors such as a patient's age, diet, and use of concomitant medications. I was just told, that, in fact, that in the United States, one in every five emergency room visit for the elderly is actually related um, to bleeding complications of warfarin. I found that hard to believe, but I'm told it's true. In any case, um, recently, FDA validated the determination that a person's genetic makeup also influences how they respond to the drug, which led to changes in warfarin's official label and its information leaflet. And this change offers healthcare providers information on how to use a genetic test to improve their estimate of a reasonable and safe warfarin dose for each individual patient. Notably also, Regulatory science can help us develop the future of cancer treatment. Research studies are identifying potential tumor markers that can indicate whether a patient's cancer will respond to a specific therapy or combination of therapies. For these markers to be applied in clinical practice, we must use this new science to guide the assessment of subpopulations of responders and the evaluation and use of new diagnostic tests in this context. 
We're also using regulatory science to gain safety and efficiency in the drug development process. For example, we're finding novel biomarkers to improve preclinical toxicity studies. Through collaboration with the European Medicines Agency and several academic and industry groups, we've recently identified and qualified novel biomarkers as an early non-invasive strategy for detecting kidney toxicity of new pharmaceuticals in animal models, an approach that is speedier, more cost-effective, and more sensitive and specific than traditional tests. Going forward, we must also rethink some of our approaches to clinical trials of promising candidate medical products. We must increasingly develop and implement new clinical trial methodologies and designs, new analytic approaches that can balance methodological rigor with the need for more rapid answers and often smaller study populations, and novel designs that can enable greater flexibility in response to emerging or evolving information while still addressing the fundamental and inescapable problems of bias and random events that make our assessments of clinical data challenging. Adaptive clinical trial design methods that allow for modifications to trial design or statistical procedures of ongoing clinical trials is one such approach. Other important strategies include the development and adoption of model and simulation technologies and the design of statistical methodologies and protocol designs for using certain data from registries, healthcare databases, and other sources to help inform our understanding of the effects of treatments and our regulatory decision making. In another important area, we can use regulatory science to enhance the science of medical product safety. We are entering a new era for safety, an era where protecting public health means that the responsibility of product regulators doesn't end when we grant a market authorization. That is merely one in a series of checkpoints to help assure safety. Historically, and to the detriment of patients, I'm afraid, researchers and regulators really focus primarily on the clinical studies leading up to product approval and market authorization. But in fact, the fuller and more accurate picture of a product comes known when that product goes from the more limited clinical testing to widespread use once available on the market. And our responsibility extends over the entirety of a product's life cycle to monitor, assess, and act on the changing benefit to risk profiles that may emerge throughout the entire time those products are on the market and to make sure that practitioners and consumers have the most up-to-date information that they need to best use the product. And I think in light of our uh, earlier presentation on um, the growing burden of chronic disease, this issue has special relevance um, because uh, treatments for chronic disease are used over a prolonged period with the potential for cumulative uh, toxicity or safety concerns. We know that there are enormous opportunities to improve both innovation and safety, but we must leverage science and research to provide the necessary tools. And developing those tools is a primary remit of regulatory science. At the heart of it is the science-based uh, um, focus of pharmacovigilance. We're using various data sets, passively and actively reported information, and data mining. We can more effectively monitor the post-market environment for safety signals and other risk concerns. And as we get better and better at looking for emerging safety signals in the marketplace, we will find them. And so we must also develop meaningful strategies to rapidly evaluate those concerns and assure the proper balance of risks and benefits for patients. This way, we can deepen our thinking and enhance our activities to better address the scientific, technical, and ethical issues involved in evaluating post-market signals about drug safety. And one last example that picks up a little bit on what um, 
David Heyman was addressing, although at the other end, not the preventing, but the responding to emerging infectious disease threats. A huge challenge we face is the development of medical countermeasures for emerging biological threats. Our rapidly transforming world demands that we prepare for a broad range of emerging disease concerns, both natural and deliberate, from SARS to pandemic influenza to new and unexpected events, including the threat of terrorism, including bioterrorism with agents like smallpox, anthrax, or possibly the unknown, as well as chemical or radiologic attack. However, in this context, there's often limited opportunity for human clinical testing or well-tested or appropriate animal models. We must use regulatory science to resolve outstanding scientific issues and develop the tools and regulatory pathways necessary to test and evaluate diagnostics, drugs, and vac vaccines for these serious potential threats to health. Also, we must develop more flexible and agile approaches to product development and manufacturing, new methods to improve product stability, and new statistical approaches to assessing efficacy with limited data. So from these examples, I hope it's clear that these regulatory challenges are fundamental to the work that we all do. The fact is that applying regulatory science and modernizing regulatory tools will ultimately help streamline the pathways for developing, evaluating, and authorizing a product, saving time and money and unnecessary patient exposure to investigational products across the board. And through modernization, as well as greater efficiency and greater clarity of our regulatory pathways, we may well help enhance the willingness of industry to invest in medical product development in key areas of unmet public health need. Success will depend on outreach and collaboration. Through FDA's new regulatory science initiative, I've made it a priority to engage with our many partners. We must be active participants in research and development with industry, other government agencies, and most importantly, with academic institutions like this one. In fact, we've just launched a new grant-making effort in regulatory science uh, with the National Institutes of Health, and we're hoping to establish centers of excellence in regulatory science that will be cross-disciplinary and cross-sectoral, um, though predominantly based in academic settings. So as I finish, I'd like to return to a theme I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. The strengthening of regulatory capacity is a key component of strengthening healthcare systems, as important as the building of hospitals and the provisioning of medical personnel. Moreover, assuring the strength and science base of a country's regulatory system has the potential for significant impact not only on the public health of a country and its healthcare delivery system, but also on the strength of the country's economy and its ability to grow. My vision, and a vision that I hope you will share, is for us to come together and engage in a truly collaborative effort to strengthen regulatory science and build regulatory capacity to take better advantage of the best possible science in the service of public health. By strengthening this field, we can make real meaningful advances for health and safety. And I'm sure you'll all agree that those advances are long overdue. We're in a position to make lasting change and to take a major step toward ending the unnecessary and unacceptable suffering that people face all over the world. We must rise to this challenge and make this possible. So as you focus your vision for this um, NIHA initiative, please do not forget this critical component of modern and effective healthcare systems regulatory capacity, and the science that underlies it. I think there are huge opportunities for work together around this critical issue, and if we really do so, I think we can reshape the future of public health for people across the world. And so I am really pleased to have been able to be part of this uh, 
meeting. I won't be able to be here tomorrow, unfortunately, because there's an international conference of drug regulatory authorities uh, taking place in Singapore as well. But I welcome the chance for some discussion now and uh, as the afternoon goes forward. Thank you. We have time for about three questions uh, before we move on to the breakout. I see uh, two hands over there. Yeah, please give them a mic. A little louder. <laughs> uh, I come from India, where we have a very primitive sort of uh, drug controller authority, which doesn't function uh, on the scale that FDA is functioning. Uh, so mostly uh, on a very small scale. However, I see a different problem in India. The gap that you described between emergence of new technology and application of that technology on a large scale, that gap is unbelievable. It isn't a small gap whatsoever. So the regulatory agencies should probably look upon taking on another domain and become facilitators of those forms of medical technology, whether it's drugs or diagnostic tools, that can be applied on a very large scale at low cost. That way, you would not be perceived as an agency that puts in roadblocks, but also as an agency that facilitates better healthcare delivery. And maybe that sort of a dimension is more realistic in the context of the developing world. Well, I think you know both are really important, and they're important in the developing world. They are also important um, in the United States. Um, and, and elsewhere. I mean, I do think that regulatory agencies such as my own sit at a critical juncture where we can look in one direction at, at the pipeline, at what um, science, discovery, and innovation can offer and how to pull it through the system. We can also look on the other side at unmet public health needs um, and how to try to stimulate and incentivize um, the development of critical products to address those needs. Um, and obviously our desire is to be a gateway, not a barrier um, to the movement of products um, to address those, those important public health needs. And I think, you know, certainly even in the short time that I've been at the FDA, I have seen that really happen in important ways. I also think you know, that especially for an agency like the U.S. FDA, we have to learn to be more flexible. We have to learn um, that the perfect can't always be the enemy of the good and that uh, some of the innovations that I was talking about in how we think about problems and address them, including, you know, how we undertake clinical trials um, and, and increasingly how we do post-marketing surveillance, all influence the ability to move critical ideas into real world products, um, continuing to monitor them, but make sure that, that you know, we are constantly um, enhancing um, the flow, especially when it comes you know, to really important public health needs. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hasbula Tabrani from Indonesia. I been observing that in regulations, at least in Indonesia, maybe also through in other countries, uh, I observed two models. First, those who have authority, lack of knowledge of the substance that they are regulating. Second one, those who have knowledge do not have authority to regulate. That creates a, a huge gap. Uh, especially in the area of um, health policy, for example, not in the area of the clinical or natural science when uh, the authority uh, listen better to the academician or, or scientist. Uh, I'm wondering whether in the U.S. you have experience how to bridging this kind of gap to make sure that the regulations made will be based on evidence in terms of uh, health care policy because most of the time in Indonesia at least for health policy a lot of politician or regulator um, create regulation based on intuitive rather than uh, science. 
So how do you deal with that? Thank you. Well, you know, the FDA in the United States operates within a, a, a pretty rigid um, legal and regulatory framework in terms of how we are at least supposed to do decision making, and it is science-based and data-driven. Um, and for the FDA in the U.S., it is, it is really on a product-by-product uh, product basis in terms of the um, available evidence to support safety um, and efficacy. Um, we are specifically uh, not supposed to take um, cost into consideration, and we're specifically not supposed to do comparative effectiveness analysis either, except when it um, relates to, you know, whether something is, is recommended as a, a primary or secondary uh, treatment for a given, given disease, and uh, uh, also in terms of whether or not we might give something an expedited approval, which is a relatively new approach, uh, when there's a serious, often life-threatening disease that has no other treatment, we will, in fact, approve with less data um, requiring the company uh, to continue to collect um, safety and efficacy information as part of an ongoing uh, assessment and review for um, formal, complete approval. So that is the world in which we operate. Sometimes it comes up against broader issues in, in health policy or politics. Um, but I, you know, think it is very important that we um, try to maintain a very clear focus, which is science-based, data-driven decision-making within the contours of our legal regulatory framework. The last question from Rubens. Yeah, uh, regulatory science is not usually well developed in most of the, of the developing countries and this is one of the neglected areas or components of the health system and uh, regulatory capacity are generally underfunded. Now on top of this are concerns related to regulatory capture and it is very critical because uh, the the regulatory activities will all depend on the perception, on the trust you know, by the service providers as well as the consumers of health goods and services. Well, you know, I, I think that what you say is, is very true. Um, at the end of the day, in my mind, you know, regulatory capacity is a vital component of the overall health care system. And at the end of the day, in almost er all areas of FDA regulation, um, and I think it's true for regulatory authorities around the world, the interests of, of industry and the regulator align in the sense that trust and confidence by the public in the product is the most fundamental aspect of the work we do and the success um, in our professional missions. Um, but it, it, is, it is easy to see some of, some of that get derailed by politics, by, uh, when you said regulatory capture, I mean, I assume you mean by industry interests. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that while building regulatory capacity is absolutely essential, you know, across um, the board, it's unrealistic that, that every single country with all of the competing pressures and priorities um, will be able to build, you know, the Cadillac of regulatory um, uh, authorities and activities, and so regional approaches become very, very important. And I think, you know, my hope would be that among the many different issues that NIHA will take up may be to look at how can, can regional regulatory capacity be strengthened. And one of the things that I think is so important about 
strengthening regulatory science is that it cuts across. It isn't something where every nation has to develop their own knowledge and tools, but we can work together, um, you know, rich countries and poor countries, um, and uh, across sectors with academia, I think, playing a really important role that is as yet underdeveloped in terms of helping us to really raise the level of understanding and harness advances in science and technology to be applied to this, this critical area, which I think, you know, really is under appreciated as part of the continuum of research activities that have to comprise our global scientific enterprise. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Amber. Allow me also to <laughs> join me to thank also Professor Heyman and Professor Zimet. Uh, that concludes the first plenary session. Thank you.